All right, so hey, yeah, I'm Tom. I work for Oracle Labs, and today I'll be giving an overview of the current state of affairs for the ARM ARCH64 uh, backend within GraalVM. Yeah. Okay, so I joined Oracle Labs and the GraalVM team in uh, 2020. I'm currently leading development for ARCH64 within the GraalVM compiler and native image. So I spend a lot of my time working on um, AR64 fixes and improvements. Uh, however, though, I also work on general purpose features for native image as well. Um, in my talk today, I'll first give a brief overview of the characteristics of a, a AR64 instruction set and why having Grout work well on ARM is important for us. After that, I'll quickly describe what parts of Grout VM work on AR64, both on Linux and Mac and cover how to build GraalVM natively on an ARM machine. Along with that, I'll also provide a quick walkthrough of some of the important ARM-specific uh, files within the Graal code base and how they relate to one another. After that, I'll show some performance numbers. And then finally, time permitting, I'll discuss some of the quirks about the ARM instruction set, which has required changes to, to, uh, changes to Graal to get rid of what I call AMD 64 isms in the code. And I'll also touch on some of the other improvements we have in plan, uh, other improvements we have in plan for the ARM backend. Two, so I don't have to keep on saying AR64 and AMD 64. I usually re will refer to um, AR64 as ARM and AMD 64 as Intel. So yeah, so um, the ARM ISO was first introduced in uh, 2011. And Apple was the first vendor to release the AR64 processor in uh, 2012 with their iPhone 5S. Android has also supported um, ARM since 2014 with uh, Android 5.0. And then actually in 2016, Intel discontinued the mobile processor work. So since then ARM has and, or had and still has essentially a monopoly within the mobile domain. Things got really interesting though for ARM when Amazon announced the Gravitron processor and its inclusion as an AWS platform in 2018. Uh, before this, there had been some attempts by Qualcomm, Marvel, and Calvium and others to build ARM servers, but they really hadn't taken off. The Gravitron was the first ARM server platform which gave good enough performance while being really cheap. Um, after that, I'd say the next big step was for the prominence for ARM was when Apple announced that they're switching all their um, PCs over to Apple Silicon. And as I'm sure you all know by now, I'd say this has really been pretty successful. They're very fast. And they show that you know computers based on the ARM ISA can be as good, if not better, than AMD and Intel computers. Also, in the meantime, in addition to trying to buy ARM, uh, NVIDIA has also um, announced servers that have ARM CPUs alongside their GPUs. And then finally, last year in uh, May, Oracle announced that they are also offering uh, Ampere machines within the Oracle Cloud infrastructure. As Oracle is a big investor in Ampere, this came as no surprise, but it was still important. To given that Oracle naturally wants things like Graal to work well in the Oracle's cloud, it has become ever more important that the Graal's ARM backend has complete functionality and um, works well. So in terms of the main characteristics of the AR64 ISA, it's a 64-bit architecture with floating point and a vector support. There are 31 general purpose registers, 32 floating points, so comma, um, vector registers, a stack point register, and a zero register. Um, currently, our machines support the NEON vector instruction set, which operates on 128 bits of uh, data at a time. And then within ARM, all instructions themselves are uh, 32 bits or four bytes long. So this is a key difference from Intel, which has a variable length encoding. So this slide is also shown by Christian, but it highlights the many features of the Graal um, ecosystem. As discussed before, Graal can be used as a compiler within Hotspot, a ahead of time executable generator for Java applications. 
and also has um, via Truffle a language interpretive framework that currently supports many different front ends. So currently on um, Linux, all of Growl works on ARM. Some things like Sulong, the LLVM bytecode interpreter, or let's say Truffle strings, may be less optimized right now, but everything should be functional. Now for Mac OS, currently the compiler and native image work on Mac, or I'm sorry, on ARM. And with, for the next release coming out later this month, uh, 22.1, we will make um, experimental downloads available for Darwin ARCH64. Um, on the Truffle side, we still need to add some things for, uh, for Sulong to support uh, Darwin's native um, application binary interface. So most Truffle languages don't work yet. Support though for that should become soon. We're actively working on it. And if you're curious about uh, following the progress in macOS compatibility, you could, um, follow the GitHub issue I linked here. So how does one go about building and developing on the ARM backend natively? Well, the, pre the process is pretty similar to just using the Intel machine. You just need to get the, you know, the ARM downloads instead. And I'd recommend using a MXFX JDK to get the proper JVMCI version. Two, uh, both IntelliJ and Eclipse work well on both ARM, Linux, and Mac. In the past, I've usually debugged things by, via using a Linux VM while running on a M1 MacBook Air. I've had no problems with that. Lately, too, though, I've also I've off um, I've started to do more of my development directly within Mac, and that's been fine. So yeah, so how does the backend work? Well. When generating, when generating code within a backend in Growl, the process is, is to go from a mostly um, target agnostic no, um, graph of Growl value nodes and then translate those into LAR instructions. So this translation of Growl nodes to LAR instructions is most of that logics in LAR generator and LAR arithmetic generator or the target specific um, implementations of these. And then at the later point, these LAR instructions are then converted to machine instructions via the assembler. So let me walk you through a little code to see what how this works. All right, so I'm gonna use for an example, watching an ad node um, and see what kind of uh, ARM code gets generated for that. So right now I'm just in the add node class of Growl. At the bottom though, you can see there's this generate method. And this is the method that's called to translate, to convert this Growl node into a LAR instruction. So what will happen is we'll call this, which is arithmetic LAR generator. This is basically just um, target agnostic boilerplate. But at the end here, what it does is it calls emit add. And this is actually target specific code. So what's happening here, I'm in the ARM version of the arithmetic generator and it's creating a binary op for the add instruction. So a lot of the um, binary arithmetic ops for ARM for or the LA instructions are in this ARC64 arithmetic op class. If you look at the binary op in here, what it is is it'll take a an instruction that has two registers as input and then creates a value in a new register. And the exact operation you perform is whatever your enum, whatever arithmetic op you're doing. So yeah, so then if you look at actually when you're emitting code for this, you're converting this LAR instruction into a machine code. What happens is you're gonna call the macro assembler and the macro assembler is basically just a wrapper around the real ARM instructions that are generated in the um, ARCH64 assembler. But it kind of, it does some checking for you and handles some cases that you don't want to have to enumerate in your code yourself. So in this case, like this macro assembler for the ARM is depending on what registers you use, it's actually one of two ARM add instructions you want to use and it will decide for you. But yeah, so that will call, let's suppose it calls this add 
and the AR64 assembler, which will then actually emit an int, which will represent the ARM instruction. Since ARM, all ARM instructions are four bytes long, you could always just write an int out and with the proper value, of course, encoded in that, and that will be the ARM instruction. So yeah, so that was a very quick walkthrough of that. My slides, and if you want to look at this later, or the pointers to the code themselves again. Also, too, here I've um, most of the ARM code is, or the backend code is just in a couple of packages. So I've listed these packages here with a little summary of them, which could serve as a reference later if you want to look at these slides at a later point. Here, too, I've listed some of the important classes. If also, again, just for reference, that these classes contain most of the ARM code. So for the backend. So yeah, so in terms of comparing the optimizations performed by Grail, uh, there's really not that much of a difference between Intel and ARM. The same passes, so the same optimization passes within the high, mid, and low tiers run on both architectures. Furthermore, in the EE version of ARM, auto vectorization works and runs the same uh, loop and linear vectorization passes as it does on Intel. Two, um, most of the intrinsics that are possible are supported on ARM. Uh, the file that we kind of keep track of what intrinsics we implement relative to hotspot is this unimplemented growl intrinsics. And you can see in that file that just a couple are missing for ARM and they should be added soon. And actually a couple of them are currently being worked on right now. So moving on to some performance numbers. In the following slides, I'll show some comparisons between, um, between ARM and Intel while running the Renaissance uh, benchmark suite. The first set of numbers will compare um, Intel's Ice Lake server against Ampere's Ultra server, while the second set of numbers will compare Ultra against the um, Apple M1 Pro. While like when I'm talking, I'm just gonna mention the geometric means of the benchmarks. In the slides, I've also attached the raw numbers in case you wanna look at them later. So some of the key characteristics of the different CPUs are shown in the table here. Um, the main thing, is that when we're performing these tests, we're comparing modern or current machines from both or from Intel, Ampere, and Apple. So yeah, this slide uh, shows a comparison between uh, C2 and Grail for both the Ice Lake and Ultra platforms for running Renaissance uh, 0 0.11 and running it on both a uh, Growl 21.1 EE and Oracle JDK 11.0.11. So for these tests, although the um, Ampere machine has 80 cores per node, we limited it to only use uh, 36 of those cores so that the number of logical CPUs available on both the Ampere and the Intel machine were the same. Um, on average, Growl was, is about 60% faster than C2 on Intel and 50% faster than C2 on ARM. So the main takeaway is that on ARM, as, with as, as is the case on Intel, uh, Growl offers substantial performance benefits over C2. And yeah, here's the raw numbers if you want to look at later. Okay, now this slide shows the average performance on Renaissance uh, 0 0.14 between the Ultra and Apple uh, M1 Pro. For these tests, the Ampere machines were limited to 10 cores to match the M1 Pro, which has uh, eight high performance and two efficiency cores. So on average, the M1 Pro outperforms the Ultra machine by around 70%. So to me, that number kind of implies two important takeaways. Um, first, expect for Max to run Growl code very fast. <laughs> but second, and more importantly, um, in future generations of ARM servers, expect a lot of um, uh, performance improvements. As the N1 chip shows, there's plenty of room for growth. So 
this should get faster. And two, oh yeah, here's the raw numbers. So and the other thing too, I think it's important to point out is while the prior slide just talked about the absolute performance of ARM servers against Intel, uh, it didn't take into the account cost. However, in many situations, what people care about is uh, performance per dollar, not just raw performance. So in, in cloud services, ARM servers are usually much cheaper than Intel servers. So for instance, in OCI, um, bare metal ARM cores cost one cents per an hour, while Intel cores, we, while the Intel cores we used for this test at least, cost around three cents an hour. So given this price disparity in terms of performance per dollar, right now already ARM is better than Intel. And the article I posted at the bottom here gives more details about the cost uh, savings benefits of using Growl and ARM64 together, at least 12 running on OCI. Now on to some uh, deep dive. So in my opinion, the two most important differences between ARM and Intel are as follows. First, in ARM, since all instructions are four bytes long, you could encode fewer immediates directly within instructions. And the second, and to be honest, more important difference between the two is that um, ARM only requires a relaxed memory consistency model. And this means that the processors are given um, much more freedom in the order in which they execute instructions. And this, this, this freedom to rearrange instructions by the processor can potentially expose some um, weird or can cause some weird races to incur when you have an incorrectly written application. So on Intel machines, PC relative branches and loads can access um, plus or minus two gigabytes from your current um, instruction or uh, instruction pointer. However, on our machines, um, PC relative branches could only access the neighboring 128 megabytes and uh, loads could only access the neighboring one megabyte. So as a workaround for this limited reach on ARM, one can instead issue a, a sequence of instructions to access uh, PC relative addresses further away. So the key for doing that is to use this ADRP instruction, which allows one to access plus or minus four gigabytes. However, when using this ADRP instruction, it doesn't set the bottom 12 bits of an address. So you need to then use a second instruction to set those bottom 12 bits. In the slide two here, I have also a link to the ADRP yeah, instruction. So if you wanna look at it more in detail. So what happened in Growl, uh, we got burned by um, this limited reach initially when we were um, porting over native image or porting over getting support for native image on ARM. Because what happened was a lot of the initial ARM code for native image was ported over without thinking too much about ARM's um, PC relative instructions limited reach. It took a while to figure out when this was actually a problem and then we had to fix them, find them and fix them. But um, to fix them too, we had to change the patching logic and we had to change it now to support um, patching multiple instructions where the immediate isn't contiguous. On an Intel machine, when you have a you have your 32 bits immediate, immediate value and it's gonna be contiguous. So you just have to write that in or rewrite that in. However, on ARM, this immediate is gonna be represented across, it, the representation is gonna be split across multiple instructions. So then you have to, have a lot more complicated patching, uh, patching patterns for that. The benefit though is when we change these patching patterns, we also added a lot of checks to make sure that what you're patching will actually is a reachable target so that we will, um, if it's not, and it, so we fix the bugs now so it shouldn't happen, but if it were to happen, it will fail to our native image as opposed to at execution time. So yeah, so that's one problem. But the trickier problem is when the bugs that arise from the different memory consistency models of Intel and ARM. 
So the memory consistency model dictates when a given memory access can be performed relative to other memory accesses issued by the same thread. So Intel's memory model is a TSO or total store order, and it only allows loads to be executed before prior stores. ARM on the other hand has a relaxed memory model where accesses to the same address must be ordered, but there are no other ordering requirements for memory, uh, for no more memory accesses. So any other ordering requirements you have have to be enforced by putting fences within the code. So to visualize this, consider the sets of reads and writes to various addresses uh, shown on the left here. Um, the errors in the two right figures show the ordering requirements that Intel and ARM's memory model impose. So for Intel, loads C, D, and E can happen in any order relative to write B, but everything else is required to be performed sequentially. On ARM, on the other hand, there are no ordering requirements. You could see there's no errors in the picture. So these, ex these instructions, these memory instructions, you could just execute in uh, arbitrary or order. So what does this mean for Java applications? Well, it means that applications with races are likely to cause um, more problems on ARM, since it is more likely for unexpected, undesirable, and incorrect reorderings to occur. So applications which may appear to um, work fine on Intel, but in fact are incorrect, actually may have their problems exposed on ARM. So one place in Growl where we ourselves have actually kind of messed up in the past with um, ARM's relaxed memory model is when trying to optimize uh, volatile accesses. So within ARM to minimize the overhead of respecting the Java and C++ memory models, ARM has added extra instructions that kind of are tailored to certain behaviors in Java and C++. And some of these instructions are uh, acquires and releases. So an acquire is an instruction that prevents subsequent instruction memory accesses from executing until that acquire executes. Whereas releases is an instruction that will not execute until all prior, primary, or sorry, until all prior memory accesses have completed. So you could think of acquires and releases as kind of one-sided fences, where acquires block everything after it and releases um, will wait until everything before it XR finished. So in addition to those kind of the generic rules for acquiring releases, the ARM memory model also states that all acquire and release instructions must be always um, ordered with regard to one another. So kind of with this overall um, specification, the acquires and release instructions are a perfect match for um, Java volatile accesses behavior of a volatile load maps to ARM's load acquire, while a volatile store can be represented as a store release. So a while back, a PR from Red Hat started to use acquire and releases for some volatile accesses, but not all of them. In particular, some native image thread local operations were still using an old implementation of having fences around the memory operations. So unfortunately, in certain cases, when the two implementations mixed, we had a problem. Specifically, if a volatile store was implemented via store release, and then the following volatile load used fences, it was possible for that fence to be executed before the store in the arms, um, on our machine, as there is no fence between the two of them. So earlier in this year, we fixed it by ensuring that all um, acquiring releases are used for all volatile accesses. But still, I think this is a good example of how one has to be very careful when trying to optimize yet still, correct, yet, yet still correctly implement uh, Java's ordering requirements on ARM. So in terms of future work, the next big thing I think we need to add is support for ARM's uh, next generation vector instruction set SVE or scalable vector extension. So current processors don't implement this, but a lot of the processors from ARM that are supposed to come out in this next year, they should be on it. 
And if we were to enable SVE, it would allow us to use um, wider vector instructions in Braille. Um, another area for improvement I think we have is to better optimize the memory accesses on ARM. I think there are opportunities to improve uh, address generation and also to further reduce the number of fences needed within ARM code. Another thing I think we could improve on is um, tuning compiler optimi optimization heuristics for ARM. Currently, they're all tuned to AMD64. Although, like, you know, this should work well enough, there's probably some room for improvement by actually tuning them for ARM. Also, on the native image side, we should add G1 GC support for EE and overall just improve the native image debugging experience on ARM. So yeah, with that, I'll um, wrap up my talk. In terms of takeaway, I'd like to remind everyone that Linux ARCH64 runs the entire GraalVM ecosystem and support is soon to be added for Mac OS as well. Like with Intel, Growl on ARM offers a lot of performance advantages over Hotspot C2. And finally, I'd like to emphasize that ARM is a high priority within Growl VM. We are continually working to reach feature parity with Intel and to ensure that optimizations work equally well on both platforms. And yeah, thanks for listening and I'll take any questions you have now. I think there's a couple of things in the chat. Do you find anything in the design of Growl and Desire that ended up being especially over specialized for AMD64 and that you need to make larger changes to accommodate ARM? Uh, the big thing were fences, I would say. A lot of the fences were kind of always talking about load, 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 store, store, load, but kind of they were a fence that just blocked everything before and after. Whereas on ARM, we kind of have these asymmetric fences. What stops it stops stuff before, but you don't really care what's after it necessarily. So we kind of had to do some work to get rid of that. I think too on um, some of the killing where we just also just kill everything around a spot, as opposed to kind of thinking about killing one only one direction. I think some of that also we could have further improvements that kind of to better fit arms, um, arms the way it uh, orders instructions. But yeah, okay. okay. Question two, Stefan, with the new M1 processors, people notice different constraints on branch prediction, scars to dump distance. Um, does Scrawl have any logic to around placing code to avoid issues with branch prediction? Um, so you mean that there's just like, do you just mean that there was performance cliffs based on how far the jump target was away or what, what do you mean exactly by this? Uh, Stefan, yes. Okay, um, we haven't done anything for that yet. I think that would fall into the kind of the larger umbrella of tuning stuff for ARM. But we, in general, we do try to, um, at least within a method itself, use shorter jumps. And only if that fails, we kind of roll back and try to re regenerate that code using the more conservative, uh, more conservative longer jumps. But that's within a given method, but yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, maybe I'll just share my screen again. One second. Yes, th those were EE. All right. Yeah, the, those are very cool uh, results and very interesting. I was just wondering, um, what's the state of uh, ARM support for uh, CE and uh, uh, how long it'll take before we can see similar numbers with CE? So, I mean, yeah, it, it works on CE. 
all the intrinsics are in CE. Kind of the same story for between EE and CE for AMD 64 that we don't have the vectorization stuff okay. in CE. But besides that, I'd assume that this kind of similar trend is okay. with Intel. I just, I didn't run the numbers to check, but yeah, okay. should should be similar. Cool. And the other question is uh, the C2 versus Growl. Uh, that one was also interesting. And I, I don't remember or recall seeing similar data with the CE. Is that, do you think that is specific to the Growl VE? Uh, VMEE performance, or uh, would we be able to see that the C2 versus Graal? Uh, so, if, so you're saying like that getting 60% say on Intel, like yeah. what do you think it would be on CE instead? Yeah, yeah. That uh, also, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, and okay. There, there, I know there's, um, I can't remember what the university is in Prague, but they're doing a lot of benchmarking, I think, okay. of CE. So I okay. think the number the numbers should be there. I guess should be public. Yeah. Cool. So uh, no, I was curious whether it was only on ARM or was it on Intel as well. So uh, was that data that that slide uh, C two versus Graal was that an ARM difference or so, is it Intel? So so the slide right there's there's the two Intel ones and then there's the two ARM ones. Okay. Right? Okay. So. So like, uh, so yeah, the point I was trying to make is like the, all this improvements you see on Intel uh, also kind of you have similar for improvements on ARM. So like ARM is kind of almost as optimized as the Intel version. Okay. That's, all was, that's all I was trying to say, but yeah. That's good, okay. Thank you, Tom.